It is always the case when somebody goes missing that there are lots of questions left unanswered. Did they leave of their own accord? Did they meet with an accident? Or is there something more sinister at play? It is far less common for someone to brazenly seize another in broad daylight or in front of others. But in some cases, this is exactly what happened. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two shocking unsolved cases of abduction. But first, I'd like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's episode. The internet is an immensely important tool for us at Cold Case Detective, where the majority of our research takes place. It provides us with access to news and information, a place to share all of our documents and data, and various streaming platforms to find valuable wisdom on the topics we are covering. The problem is, sometimes that critical documentary isn't available in the country we're located, and public Wi-Fi leaves us concerned about sharing files across easily accessible servers. Luckily, with Surfshark VPN, those concerns are completely solved. Surfshark VPN is an unparalleled virtual private network. With unbelievably protective perks and easy-to-navigate security features meant to mask your online activity. All of your internet browsing, including where you're doing it from, is withheld via military-grade encryption to prevent people from snooping in. This allows you to share files safely, access your bank accounts, and feel confident wherever you are, even when using shared Wi-Fi. Surfshark VPN also allows you to change your location in real time to one of many servers found all over the globe. This means that if a certain film or documentary we need for research is unavailable in our country, we can simply travel to a different part of the world via Surfshark and access that media in a matter of seconds. It's a seamless process with zero risk attached. Surfshark VPN also includes a no strings attached, no logs policy meaning your data will never be collected or sold no matter what. You can also enjoy the peace of mind of their cookie pop-up blocker and clean web initiative, where millions of phishing scams and malicious websites are automatically blocked at your convenience. Sign up for Surfshark VPN using the link in the description below and enter promo code COLDCASE for 83% off and an extra three months for free. The internet is an unpredictable place, Use the tools at your disposal to make it secure. Heather Teague. On the afternoon of August 26th, 1995, Tim Walthall peered through a telescope lens across the Ohio River to Newborough Beach in Henderson County, Kentucky. He noticed a young woman sunbathing and was shocked a mere moment later when a man emerged from the nearby woods, grabbed the woman's hair, and dragged her off. After the witness alerted the police, the young woman was identified as 23-year-old Heather Teague. Heather had been sunbathing alone on the beach when she was grabbed and pulled into a wooded area at gunpoint at around 12.45 p.m. Her abductor is described as being six foot tall, weighing around 210 to 230 pounds, with brown hair and a bushy beard. He wore jeans, but no shirt. After investigators arrived on the scene, they reportedly found half of Heather's bikini, as well as some other evidence, although it has never been revealed what else was discovered. Nothing that was found that day led them to the 23-year-old's whereabouts. Later that same day, a resident of Henderson County, Marvin Marty Ray Dill, was pulled over during a routine traffic stop. He was driving a red and white Ford Bronco, a car matching the description of one which had been parked next to Heather's at the time of her abduction. Inside the vehicle, the police found numerous disturbing things, including two guns, two knives, duct tape, rubber gloves, and rope. There were also blood stains on the inside tailgate, and hair similar to Heather's was noted inside too. Furthermore, Dill resembled the sketch that had been created with the help of the crime's only witness, Tim Walthall. Over the next few days, investigators received several tips connecting Dill to the crime, 
and decided to question him further. Reportedly, when he saw the police arrive, Dill told his wife to leave the house. Once she was gone, he shot himself. He was dead before authorities could even enter the home. Still, following his death, prosecutors compiled evidence against him and brought that information to a grand jury. Here, Dill's wife was called as a witness, but she refused to talk about Heather or answer any questions, invoking her Fifth Amendment right. However, Dill isn't the only suspect in the case. Christopher J. Bellow, a Henderson native, is also thought to possibly be involved. Following the 1991 death of Catherine Fetzer, Bellow pled guilty to attempted involuntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 11 to 18 years in prison. Catherine, whose body has never been found, went missing on November 26, 1991 from Medina, Ohio. The 26-year-old left a note for her husband, letting him know she planned to go out window shopping, but never came home. She was having an affair with Bellow at the time, who was a co-worker. Bellow claimed he was at work at the time of her disappearance, but his alibi was proven to be false, and he later confessed to shooting her in his apartment. Investigators believe he did so because Catherine wanted to end the relationship. He stated he disposed of her remains in a bin. Bellow is also suspected of being involved in the disappearances of several other women, including Mary Cushto, 43, who vanished from St. Cloud, Florida on May 5, 1998. Investigators believe that Bello may have targeted other women who resembled Catherine, including Heather Teague. While he was residing in Henderson at the time of her disappearance, he left the state on the day that Dill took his own life. The pair reportedly had several acquaintances in common. Although Tim Walthall only identified Dill, law enforcement has suggested that Dill and Bello worked together, that Dill grabbed Heather while Bello waited in the car. Bellow has never been charged in connection with Heather's disappearance, however, as there has never been enough evidence to do so. Leads in Heather's case have been few and far between in the years since. According to local rumor, Heather's remains were fed to pigs or dumped down a well. In 2016, an oil tank was searched by the police. It was located in a desolate part of Union County, not far from the beach. Heather's mother, Sarah, stated, I had a girl that contacted me to say she had heard that Heather was put into an oil tank. There were three that was on the platform. I haven't slept in two weeks. I keep having this image that Heather's hair is caught in some kind of gear. Then in October of 2021, hopes were raised again when a skull and bones were found near the Ohio River. However, dental records have ruled out the remains as being Heather's. In 2013, Sarah Teague filed a lawsuit against local, state, and federal authorities in connection with the case. She alleged malfeasance and a cover-up, claiming they focused on the wrong suspect and failed to follow up on other leads. Heather Teague is still missing. She was 23 when she was seized by a man on Newborough Beach in Henderson County, Kentucky, on the afternoon of August 26, 1995. Heather is described as a white woman with brown hair and green eyes. She weighs around 90 to 100 pounds and is five foot two inches tall. She is a sufferer of scoliosis and her spine curves slightly but noticeably as a result of her condition. And she has a circular red birthmark on her right buttock. She also has flat feet. If Heather is still alive, she will be 49 years old. If you have any information about her disappearance, you can call the Kentucky State Police at 270-826-3312. Joan Gay Croft. On April 9th, 1947, a massive tornado swept across North America, killing 185 people and injuring over a thousand more. In its path, the tornado destroyed the small town of Woodward, located in Woodward County, Oklahoma. At the time, the telephone workers in the area were on strike, meaning that city officials had not been warned of the natural disaster on its way to the town, and they were, as a result, unable to instruct civilians to take cover and brace themselves. The twister touched down at 8.43 p.m., reaching speeds between 220 to 440 miles per hour, and leaving behind a devastating path of destruction. The homes of most families in the area were destroyed, including that of the Croft family. Hutchinson Olin Croft was a successful sheep farmer and a prominent member of the community. 
He was married to 26-year-old Cleta, who had a seven-year-old daughter from a previous marriage named Jerry. The couple also had their own child, four-year-old Joan Gay Croft. The family had been home on the night the Twister arrived. Cleta tragically was crushed by a fallen wall, while Olin was severely injured. The children were discovered by a neighbor in the aftermath, bruised and cut for the most part, but okay. A piece of wood, about the size of a pencil, had lodged itself into Joan's leg. The family were rushed to the hospital. Those with non-life-threatening injuries were placed either in the front garden of Woodward Hospital or in its basement. Jerry and Joan were placed in the latter as they awaited treatment, while their father was placed in a makeshift hospital in a nearby hotel so he could recover. In the chaotic aftermath of the tornado, there was a mix-up that led Olin's sister Ruth to believe he was dead. His name was listed among the deceased in a local paper, but it was, in fact, a man named Olan Hutchinson who had passed away. Ruth made her way to Woodward to collect Jerry and Joan, but was relieved to arrive and find out that her brother was recovering in hospital and the children were okay. Ruth checked on her nieces before leaving them to volunteer at another hospital, but things took a turn when she returned the following day to see them. When Ruth arrived at Woodward Hospital, she was surprised to find that Jerry was alone. The seven-year-old was upset and crying, and through her tears, explained that Joan had been taken in the middle of the night. She said two men in khaki clothing came during the night and asked for Joan by name. Jerry recalled that her younger sibling cried for her, and she didn't want to leave her sister behind. Nurses who overheard the commotion soothed the four-year-old and told her the men would come back to collect Jerry later. The men, for their part, explained to hospital staff that they were relocating Joan to an Oklahoma City hospital. Medical staff at Woodward, who were likely exhausted and overrun with patients, assumed the men were acting in an official capacity and let them go without question. Upon finding all this out, Ruth began calling around hospitals in Oklahoma City, but no one had any record of Joan Croft and nobody was expecting her. Ruth took things one step further and called other hospitals, orphanages, and morgues looking for her missing niece, but came away from each phone call without any clues as to where Joan may have gone. The day after the tornado hit on April 10th, the townspeople began to clear up the town. Several deceased children were found amongst the wreckage at this time, all of them girls. One of them, a three to four year old with reddish blonde hair, was initially suspected to be Joan, but family members disagreed with this idea. Ruth was sent to identify the remains, but was certain they were not of Joan. Furthermore, Joan's clothing was found to be too big for the girl in the morgue. Locals thought the girl was more likely to be one who came from a broken home and was being raised by her grandmother at the time of her death. The grandmother refused to identify the body, likely because the family was destitute and unable to pay for the burial. The highway patrol searched for Joan across five states. Once Olin had recovered from his injuries, he joined in and had posters made and distributed with Joan's photograph on them. He also participated in radio interviews and remarked that Joan was an incredibly shy girl who avoided talking to strangers. She also had a noticeable lisp, which could make her difficult to understand sometimes. Still, Every tip and every possible sighting of Joan took investigators to a dead end. There was no trace of the four-year-old anywhere, her entire disappearance shrouded in mystery. There are only a few theories in Joan's case. It has been suggested that perhaps she was taken to be sold to another wealthy family. Armchair detectives have brought up Georgia Tan, a Tennessee-based woman who was known to take young babies and children from hospitals and sell them to rich families. Although Tan worked in the South, she wasn't the only one to be involved in the trading of children. However, this isn't the strongest idea because the children who were sold were often from poor households. Joan was part of a very prominent and wealthy family, meaning her case attracted a lot of attention and her father was able to spend a lot of time and resources looking for her. Joan wasn't really an ideal target in this regard. Another suggestion is that Joan was taken to be held for ransom, although no ransom ever came. Furthermore, at the time of her disappearance, both her parents had been listed as dead, so who did the kidnappers think was going to pay them? Also, if Joan was going to be held for ransom, why leave Jerry behind? 
This is a question that comes up time and time again, no matter what theory we explore. Jerry being left seems odd. If somebody wanted money, or if they simply wanted children to exploit, why only take one of the two children available? The answer still eludes investigators. The case has been largely cold since 1947. In April of 1999, a journalist with the Woodward County Journal, Robert Lee, was sent an email by a woman claiming to be Joan. The woman spelt her middle name as Gay with an E and claimed that both sides of her family knew where she was and what had become of her. She said she was raised in Oklahoma City. The initial email read, in part, How would you like to write an article about what really happened to Joan Gay and where she's been this past 54 years? She has been and is living in OKC, off and on since 1956, under a different name, with the full knowledge of her father, Orlin Croft. She even graduated from an OKC high school under her different name. Lee, who had written numerous articles about Joan's puzzling case, responded to the email. The writer of the initial message replied again, this time stating the following, I know this time of year there are many people who crawl out of the woodwork claiming to be the lost girl, but I was never physically lost. My immediate families knew where I was, I just didn't know who I was. Until just lately, I never faced the fact that Cleta Scott, my mother, died upon me. I buried this information deep within my long-term memory and refused to accept. If you want to know the rest, email me. The woman suggested that the two meet in public, but not publicly. She did not want attention from the media, nor did she want any money. However, communications after this point cease. Emails that Lee sent to the woman went undelivered. As it was 1999, there was no easy way to trace the owner of the email and find out where the messages originated from. The Highway Patrol, who originally investigated the case, often come back to the idea that Joan was the young, reddish blonde girl found in the rubble, believing that she was taken, killed, and dumped. While it seems odd that children went unclaimed at this time, it meant that struggling families, who'd just lost everything, didn't have to pay for burial as well. All of the children found were buried by the town. To this day, not one of them has ever been identified. Olin remarried just three months after the tornado hit, in July of 1947. It is unclear what became of Jerry during this time. Some sources claim Olin took her with him when he remarried and moved, but others have alleged that he didn't care for her after the death of her mother because she wasn't his biological child, and therefore, to his mind, not his responsibility. Little is documented about Jerry in the years since her sister's disappearance, and it does not appear that she has been searching for her younger sibling. She reportedly denied to give a DNA sample in the 1990s. Ruth's daughter and Joan's cousin, Marvella, spoke with Oklahoma News 4 in 2016, and she said the family thought Joan had been taken by somebody who lost a child during the tornado. She also provided a DNA sample, hoping that investigators would get a hit somewhere on a database. However, so far, this hasn't happened, and the family are still awaiting answers. Joan Gay Croft went missing sometime during the night between April 9th and April 10th of 1947 from the town of Woodward in Oklahoma. She was just four years old at the time, weighing 42 pounds and standing at five foot three. She had strawberry blonde hair, blue eyes, and chickenpox scars on her forearms. She had been wearing pajamas at the time of her disappearance. If you have any information about Joan's disappearance, you can contact the Woodward Police Department on 580-256-2280. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.